Okay, welcome everyone. This is uh, for the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, uh, June the 7th, and I'm Farrell Turner. And the title for today's lesson is Living as God's People. And the scripture for today is out of Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. And this is part of the first quarter's uh, topic, which focuses on communities. And so, um, if you would, bow your heads and let's look, open with a prayer. Good morning, Father. Thank you again for another day. Lord, we continue to deal with so much uncertainty, so much hurt, so much illness, so much pain. Help us to remember to rely on you and to seek your guidance. Lord, we so easily lose sight of those around us while we're so busy. If anything, this time has allowed us a time of slowing down, a time of remembrance. Lord, help us to remember Jesus' commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves. Help us to continue to prayerfully seek your guidance. We ask that the Holy Spirit in our hearts and our minds during this time to better understand and to live your word. We just pray for all these things in thy name. Amen. Um, so today, I just want to start off by saying uh, that this is about the exodus of the Israelites who were led by Moses. And as always in, in trying to study these lessons, uh, I'd reach out to try to get some additional information. And one of the things I thought about is just, what does Moses mean? And so uh, Moses in Hebrew means to pull out or to draw out. And so I just think that that's pretty, uh, pretty appropriate for this lesson as he leads the Israelites um, out of Egypt. And so as I mentioned, this series focuses on community. And so we'll be looking at how God forms a community through Scripture. And as we do that, we'll learn more of how God calls for communities to form amidst our forebearers in the faith, and we learn how God forms communities today. Uh, this first lesson, as I mentioned, is Deuteronomy. Um, it's the final book in the Pentateuch, and its Greek name means second law. So there's very little narrative in this book. Instead, it focuses um, on uh, a lengthy sermon or speech given by Moses right before he dies. Um, so Moses gives the history of the people of the Exodus and recounts the, the summary of God's teachings. Uh, think of what the community was doing during those 40 years. The, the society had to consist of a lot of different things. Uh, but during this time, uh, Moses uh, does this speech. He talks about uh, the history and where they come from. Uh, in that context, most scholars contend that someone else wrote the book as Moses' death is included in the book. The attributed writers are those who were an intellectual movement who had connections to the Levitical priesthood and hoped to help the people in exile and to return from exile. The group of writers are called Deuteronomists or the Deuteronomist school. Much like history writers of today, the Deuter Deuteronomic school sought to help the people understand a little better who they were, and their relationship to God and the land. In the chapter that we read today, we dive into the commandments and the prescriptions given to the people of God. Line by line, both the history of the Exodus is given along with a theological explanation of why it was part of their history. Their history is to inform them of their future and what they are called to do. The major caveat is how all this stems from the commandment to help the people enter the land that God swore to their ancestors. God has already promised the land to the people, and of course God keeps his promises. Now comes the time for the people to fulfill their end of the deal. With the breakdown of their history, they are reminded of their long road in the wilderness and all the time that they spent wandering. They are reminded of all the many times that they did not keep God's commandments and yet God provided. God was faithful even when they were not faithful. Now, yet now is a new day. They have traveled for over 40 years. They find themselves ready to enter the promised land. Their trials have made them stronger, and now they are about to enter the land flowing with milk and honey. God gave them uh, the bounty to eat, and they will praise God for what they have received. So now, if you will, let's read the scripture for today. And again, it's Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. 
this entire commandment that I command you today, you must diligently observe so that you may live and increase and go in and occupy the land that the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember the long way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness in order to humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. He humbled you by letting you hunger and then by feeding you with manna, with which neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted, in order to make you understand that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes back from the mouth of the Lord. The clothes on your back did not wear out, and your feet did not swell these forty years. Know then in your heart that as a parent dis disciplines a child, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Therefore, keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with flowing streams, with springs and with underground waters welling up in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and of honey, a land where you may eat bread without scarcity, where you will lack for nothing a land whose stones are iron and from whose hills you may mine copper. You shall eat your fill and bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. And so that's Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 10 in the New Revised Standard Version. So um, here they were, they were um, approaching the promised land uh, some of the uh, scriptures prior to all this, uh, you may recall that they had sent spies out about years before into the land to try to, to see what was there. And of course, they came back and said that, that um, as this scripture says today, that it, it was full uh, of uh, good things, that you know, fruits and vegetables, uh, uh, resources of water, it was a land of plenty. But it was also inhabited by a group of people who were who were not very um, not very helpful and not likely to be welcoming to them, and so because of that, uh, the people were afraid, and so uh, Moses had reminded them that because that they were weak, that they did not trust in the Lord uh, about this matter, that that generation of adults who came out of Egypt to see the fulfillment of the promised land. The only ones who were allowed to experience the promised land were the two faithful, faithful spies and those who were children at the time. Uh, it was up to that next generation to inherit God's great promises. The people needed to be reminded of two things. God has always been the source of their, their salvation and he had provided a way of life that would allow them to live abundantly. God knew there would be multiple temptations. They would want to use some of their wealth of the nations for themselves. They would be tempted to follow the gods of other nations. They would intermarry with the Canaanites who lived in the land, and the Israelite way of life would be diluted. God had a specific purpose for creating the people of Israel as his own people. They were to reflect God's nature, and that was to be holy as God is holy, to be used by God to bring blessing on all the families of the earth. They were going to encounter difficulties after they entered the land. Life would not be easy. They would face peoples who would try to destroy them. Moses exhorted the people to rely on God to fight their battles for them and not to rely on their own power. Do what I told you, you will live long in the land. The people didn't get to pick and choose which of God's words to keep and which to ignore. This is the same kind of care that humans were, expect, were supposed to give the garden in the, in the original Eden. The first verse lit to the future. The next four verses remembered the past. God used this to uh, tie to test the heart or the will of God's people. They wandered because they had been too afraid to rely upon God. They had to be taught that they could trust God to provide for them. God's commandments were about how the people were to live together as a covenant community. The people had to unlearn the way that uh, their former way of life. It said in the scripture that the Lord your God has carried you just as, your, as a parent carries a child. 
they were exhorted to keep God's commandments. This was called incarnation theology. The people could only keep the commandments by walking in the way of the Lord and by worshiping and serving the Lord. The people were told to fear the God, uh, but this word in Hebrew is actually translated to have reverence in um, to and for worship. Um, the Israelite worship was focused on repentance, praise, and thanksgiving. The point of worship was to be in communion with God and with others in the covenant in a covenant community. Worship is the place where people remembered the stories of God's mighty acts of salvation. They celebrated God's goodness. They lamented their sins and where they received their forgiveness that led to restoration of the divine human relationship. The people complained about the scarcity of water during the Exodus. That's why the, the, the descriptions of the promised land emphasize the abundance of water. Grains were for bread, vines for growing grapes, uh, also providing food and wine. Figs were a nutritious fruit. Pomegranate is a popular fruit and a symbol of both fertility and beauty. Olives were for food and oil. That included cooking, lighting, healing, and anointing. Honey was a product of a fruit such as dates or figs. All displayed the land's richness and abundance. The land would also have materials to make tools and weapons. These included iron and copper. Taken together, this picture of the land described a place where the Israelites would be prosperous, lacking for nothing. That would turn out to be a problem. In their prosperity, they would forget that all of this was a gift from God. The people were instructed to thank the Lord when they were all enjoying all the benefits of the land. The proper response to God's gifts was thanksgiving and praise. It was also a remembrance and a new resolve to follow in God's ways. The people were warned against arrogance and relying upon their own strength. They were warned of the consequences for um, failure to honor God and to follow God's commandments. Whether or not they, whether they love God or not, God's abiding love remained the same. The Lord loves us at our best and at our worst. However, and in the final analysis, choices do have consequences. Unlike Egypt, with its harsh realities, it would be a land that would uh, belong to the people. We can understand how this new and radically different lifestyle might be a cultural shock to some of the Israelites, thus causing them to forget God, but there would be opportunity to create prosperity and wealth through the mining of copper and iron. So let's look at the journey of the Israelite community. Uh, behind me, uh, you'll see a map. Um, so they spent time in the Sinai Peninsula, and they wandered through the desert to the south it's slightly west of Canaan. So if you'll look here, they began their journey up right about here. Um, and you can see that there are several routes that are projected on, uh, on how we think that they may have, um, uh, have passed on their journey. The, the one thing that, that they knew, do know for sure is that they ended up at Kadesh Barnea at the southern edge of the Promised Land. And that was right about there. So how do we know the paths uh, that they possibly took? Uh, I looked this up on the internet, and um, those are referred to as the stations of the Exodus. There are actually 42 locations visited by the Israelites following their exodus from Egypt. These are recorded in various books of the Bible, including Numbers chapter 33, and also uh, in the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy. According to uh, the documentary hypothesis, the list of the stations is believed to have originally been a distinct and, so and separate source text. In this hypothesis, it is believed that the person putting this together and combining the Torah's sources used parts of the station's list to fill out awkward joins between the main sources. The list records the locations visited by the Israelites during their journey through the wilderness after having left Egypt. Consequently, the parts which were inserted to join up the sources appear in suitable locations in the books of Exodus and Numbers. However, a slightly variant version of the list appears in full 
that numbers chapter 33. And several parts of the journey described in the full list, most notice, noticeably, the journey from Sinai to Zen did not appear in the fragmented version. So another question that, that I got to thinking about is that just how many people did Moses lead out of Egypt? A study of ancient Hebrew scriptures that I found was conducted. Based upon the literal interpretation of the English version of the scriptures, the estimate could be somewhere between 2 million and 6 million people. Just think about that. You know, 2 to 6 million people. The problem with that is that the then estimates of the entire population of Egypt at that time ranged only between 2 million and 5 million people. So that tends to make you wonder a little bit about that estimate. Sometimes in the English version of scriptures, uh, we tend to think things are more literal in, uh, compared to a lot of the Hebrew way of discussing things. Part of this analysis, which is really interesting, is that they use the lineage of Abraham to Moses and estimated the number of people generated from that lineage. Logistically, millions of Israelites would be difficult if not impossible to maintain. Just think about food, housing, sanitation, and whatever. Um, it is mentioned in the scriptures that they were, they were followed by 600 Egyptian chariots and that they felt threatened. So you think about it, if you were, if you were a society of 2 million people, are 600 chariots going to threaten you? You know, probably not. Uh, when you go through all of the analysis of the generations that uh, likely uh, happened but, um, but before Moses' time, and including the number of years that they were uh, in Egypt, including um, you know, the times after Joseph uh, was involved with Egypt, and, and also you know, the scriptures talk about at this time that the Egyptians did not even remember Joseph. You know, practically, they're thinking that there was probably more around 6,000 people rather than 2 to 6 million. And I think that probably is a much more uh, realistic number. So, you know, with the topic this quarter thinking about community, just think about that within those people that Moses led, what do you think about the society or the community that he led? You know, we, we hear from time to time uh, the people were constantly complaining. You know, um, we hear of insurrections, that they were undermining Moses' authority, that they were spreading fear and uncertainty. There had to be informal leaders within the group, for better or for worse. So, uh, you know, the other thing to think about it, and this is in more of today's lingo, do you think that Moses maybe was, caught, was more of a helicopter parent where he was trying to micromanage doing for the people what they could do for themselves, were the people, people so micromanaged as slaves in Egypt that they had lost the ability to think for themselves or to even lead themselves. It kind of makes you wonder just what that might have been like. But we're reminded that because of the reluctance to enter the promised land after hearing from spies that they had sent there, that generation was not allowed to enter the promised land. A generation had to pass over the 40 years in order to prepare a generation to lead the promised land. Only the two loyal spies and those who were children at the time were allowed to enter the promised land. So you think about that, that it's pretty much a generation. You know, people did not live quite as long back then, and you think about 40 years, it's probably maybe uh, at least close to the lifespan of someone back at that time. You know, today we think of a generation and uh, the expected uh, uh, lifetime of someone in the United States is, you know, probably somewhere 8, 75, 80 years, maybe more. You know, we tend to be living a lot longer. But uh, a generation uh, is, is referred to as a seculum. And so traditionally that's a full lifetime, a period of 80 to 100 years. Uh, historians uh, find that... Um, Every time that there is a turning of a seculum, or each generation, uh, a period of 80 to 100 years, that there is a major upheaval. And so you could think, you know, you know, maybe that generation was shorter in the time of Moses and the Israelites, but that very easily could have been considered a seculum. That they, 
in their society, they went from living as slaves in Egypt um, to uh, going through the Exodus and then going through this turning, if you will, uh, that resulted in them entering the Promised Land. The historians discussed during that time, uh, and, and you know, you think about all the upheavals that we have going on now uh, in our society, that um, it, this very well may be another one of those turnings. The historians who have studied this discussed that during a turning, there would be the importance of valuing virtues. So people who um, do what they say and say what they do, uh, that building relationships are important. And so, you know, working with one another, um, having those relationships. You know, a lot of us say a lot of times that it's not what you know, but who you know. And a lot of times those relationships can be very important. They also emphasized developing teamwork, that we work together and not alone. And so that can be important. They also said that it's very important for um, to nurture and maintain a supported family. They also discussed about diversification, not only in resources, but also in our activities. So these are just things to think about. You know, in a lot of ways, the story of the Israelites is our story. Our final destination is good and available to all who will stay on the journey, tired feet and all, and so where do you see yourself in this picture? Don't just learn the, history, learn the story, but seek to capture the spirit uh, that comes through the story. It is love worth finding. Are the promises of God wonderful to you? If so, how might you share these promises with others? What are or were the promises of our, our forefathers? Because of the evils of society, Everyone has a reason for the breakdown of our society today. We are a fallen people living in a fallen world, and we need continual reminders that we do not have the power to save ourselves. In today's scriptures, we find two related suggestions about what can save us. First are the saving acts of God. It turns out that we, like the people of Israel, need continual reminders of, saving, uh, of God's saving acts. Second, we need to take seriously the guidelines that God has provided for living a life that allows us to be part of the blessing that, God's, that God wants to bring to the world through us. As we study this passage, we should keep both of these ideas in mind. You just keep it in mind that we are allowed to do things. We have the opportunity, but it is up to us to make sure that we um, uh, take the initiative. One of the additional parts of both the study guide, um, the student guide, and the teacher's guide talks about uh, a suggestion uh, related to the spiritual practice of study. And so um, I just want to spend a minute on that. This, this is a, uh, a conscious and um, purposeful practice of studying the Bible. The spiritual practice uh, for these first four lessons calls us to renew our faith by, by becoming more intentional and serious about our study of the Bible. So what? how do you study the Bible? Do you read your daily devotional? I know uh, personally I get an email every morning in the upper room and that's always at least, if, if nothing else, just something that prompts me to take care of that. Um, one of the things that I did for years um, Many of you may remember and have heard me talk about that Beverly and I went through uh, the walk to Emmaus, only the version that we went through was called um, Curcio. Uh, and after we completed Curcio, uh, one of our church members at the church we were at at that time gave me a copy of Our Utmost for His Highest, and that's by Oswald Chambers. And so in that, there is a devotional for every 365 days of the year and I would go through that, and for years I used that as the sole devotional that I did. And it always amazed me that even though on a given day there might be a devotional that at the time really didn't mean that much to me, that maybe a year or two or three later would, uh, would really hit home. And so that was very purposeful for me. You know, one of the other aspects of it, especially in my Christian walk, um, I was always intimidated 
by really not knowing the Bible, that I felt like, you know, people could, um, uh, and maybe just because I didn't go to church quite as much when I was younger, that I really don't, did not have devoted to memory much of the scriptures that a lot of people can rattle off. And so um, I went through and we started uh, really when we were uh, going to church down in Albany, Georgia, that we began um, participating in the disciple Bible study. And then uh, I think I've been through two years of that when we moved back home. And there were, and many of you may have participated in the disciple Bible study here. And so like it, in Disciple 1, in a year's time, you pretty much cover the entire Bible and you go on through. And I, I don't know how many of the, that there are out there now. It may be five or six of those disciple studies um, that focus on uh, a little more detail within the Bible. But after having gone through the disciple Bible study, it so much helped me uh, to become much more comfortable in reading the Bible and understanding what's going on within the Bible. So I would just challenge you, become more intentional and serious about your study of the Bible. Reading and studying helps us to, um, to lead to thinking, reflecting, and meditating. And meditating on, meditating on the scripture draws us into its truth. You know, all these studies have helped me in my walk uh, to sort of get over my fear of studying the Bible. You know, I'm still not where I like to be, but I am much further much better off than, uh, than what I had been. So um, that's about it for today. Um, my wife was, was giving me um, some um, sort of background little sayings as we went along. And so uh, the one for today that I wanted to use and, and before I close our prayer, just to think about this, that blessed are the flexible for they shall not be. And so with that, if you'll close your eyes and bow your heads, we'll close with a prayer to the Holy Spirit. And so if you know that, you can join me as we say this prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may, we may be truly wise and forever enjoy your consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you.